Hello everyone. I am Sarah Jemanski, the educator for Ag and Natural Resources in Perry County, Indiana. And I would like to you know, welcome you to our September Small Ruminant webinar. Today we have two guest speakers for you. We have Miranda Edge, the Ag and Natural Resources educator from Harrison County, and Cora Carter, the Ag and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator, is that correct? in Bartholomew County. And today they are going to talk to you about small ruminant predator protection. Both of them have been on our animal science you know, focus group for quite a long time. And so we're looking forward to hearing from them today. So everybody, here's Miranda and Cora. Thanks, Sarah, appreciate that. Um, again, I'm in Harrison County, I want to disclose that my knowledge is based a lot off of a year of um, issues and learning hands-on so that hands-on learning has been only for about a year for me but book and research and things like that i've kind of collected for several years so i know cora is a little bit more of a expert in um, predator protection but i've had a little of my own experiences this last year so today we're gonna start by covering um, some types of predators that we would be worried about specifically for these small ruminants, different types of fencing options that would help to, to, to deter or stop them, lethal controls, and then livestock guardian animal options for those predators to keep them either at bay or even to stop them. So one of the major issues, of course, for these smaller ruminants is that We've got predators of all kinds in this area. Um, I'm not sure where you're checking in from, but I'm in Southern Indiana and I have issues with all of the predators seen here on the screen. Coyotes, the neighborhood dogs, black headed vultures. Um, we've got even some big cats and foxes. Um, foxes are maybe more of a problem for babies rather than the larger ones. Um, but it will be an issue, uh, and these are kind of the, the ones that we really want to look at, too. Um, honestly, my biggest problem that I've had with a predator situation have been the neighborhood dogs more than anything else. Um, we, I'm renting land where there's also cattle run, um, chickens, there's lots of different types of livestock, and so the coyotes haven't really been a huge issue because the cows are almost surrounding my sheep um, but the neighborhood dogs are the ones that come in and try to pester and figure out what those are especially being a new livestock on that property so um, you might look and see what what your neighborhood looks like um, the rural part of the neighborhoods you know may have more dogs than anything else um, when I purchased my livestock guardian dogs, and we'll talk more about those, the gentleman I purchased off of said that even he has more problem with those um, neighborhood or feral dogs than anything else. So there's lots of protection laws for some of these livestock, so you just, or for the, rather the predators. Um, so looking and understanding what those laws are, are really important to make sure that you handle the predator protection situation um, specific for that type of predator. Check with your local laws. Your conservation officers are always willing to help to make sure that predators are managed uh, based off of their uh, permitting laws and what you're able to do for specific fencing, lethal methods, um, what's the advantages, what's the drawbacks. They're also a good person to look into um, for your local specific issues. Um, we'll go into a little bit more about those um, particular solutions here in just a minute. So first we'll start with fencing. Sometimes it feels like I need Fort Knox to keep those stinking sheep in and the predators out. I'm sure some of you all have thought the same thing. Um, and there's a lot of truth in the statement of a good fence makes a good neighbor. So this concept definitely applies to predator control. You need to have a good permanent exterior fence to help reduce the amount of predators that are able to come in, whether that includes um, some barbed wire, a 
high tensile fence with electric bolt. Um, there's lots of options out there. Here we've kind of got some permanent fencing that materials that I have seen and also have used myself. Um, it's nice to be able to have that woven wire if it's uh, at all possible. It's harder for those predators to get through the woven wire. You can still put an electric charge on a wire running around the inside, outside, top, middle, you know, wherever you might need to to help with something maybe going over the fence, under the fence, things like that. Um, but that woven wire on your out, outside exterior property line fencing is probably the number one um, solution or suggestion that we would have for the pred predator controls and for the safety of your small ruminant livestock. Around here, if you're renting property, if you're going on to new property, you see a lot of barbed wire. You see a lot of old barbed wire. So that is an option. It's maybe not the greatest. Um, especially for sheep that may have their wool stuck to it. Um, I have hair sheep, not so much worried about it, but anybody who's got a wool sheep, wool breed sheep, that, that may be an issue and cause some issues with your wool integrity um, and the amount that you have available later. High tensile um, is easy to put up. You do have to put a lot more up um, and all of the tensile wires should be uh, charged so that if an animal, a predator animal tries to go through at any point, they would be shocked on their belly and as well as on their top and then start to learn that that is not a good place to cross and enter into your pasture. Most of the issues you're going to see are of course during the night. Um, so an option you might think about doing is having a nighttime corral where you're pinning in your animals a little bit closer to a barn um, not necessarily inside, but using that woven wire, using uh, electric voltage, and maybe making it a little bit more secure for the evening time, and then releasing them out to pasture during the day. Um, again, it, it all depends on what your land looks like, what your predator issues are. Um, I personally do not uh, keep mine in during the evening, but they all have access to the barn at this point in time so they can come up um, and, and get out of the wind, rain, snow, whatever, as well as to get away from some of those predators. Um, specific for, tight, or the, for the charged wires or electric wires, you want to have those at some different lengths and heights um, on your fence. It would it's nice for anything that would to burrow under to have a trip wire about six inches off the main fence and then another one six to 12 in inches off the ground from there. So that as that predator may be stepping and moving towards the fence and trying to look for a way in, they're getting shocked at different points and learn to stay far away from that fence and not try to push their um, barriers. You may even find that sometimes a buried wire um, is a, a need. Again, looking at what those are, maybe if it's a badger or something that's going to burrow. The top line um, of a fence is important to keep those um, climbing dogs, coyotes, cats, things like that out um, and would be a good deterrent as well. Your biggest issue with, of course, electric is um, at your gate point, that's your weakest point and making sure that you have some sort of an electric charge or at least a barrier at your gate to make sure that there are no um, ways for that predator to slide in that way is also important to think about. So um, whether that's running an electric wire across the gate after it's closed, which is what I have been using as my method, um, or even um, adding some extra cattle panels, woven wires, or solid panel so that it's harder for those animals to get through on those spaces. If you are also doing some maybe temporary grazing, rotational grazing, you've got options for a woven wire mesh um, with step-in posts or a, um, a nylon or a, a charged wire rather. Um, and these two different particular ones are, are ones that I use. The woven wire you can get in several different sizes, shapes, types. This one is a chicken or a poultry fencing. And then the one on the right is a Gallagher system. And both of them have the ability to 
to be charged completely. So voltage goes from the bottom all the way to the top, which is nice that when you have tall grass, um, it doesn't short out your electric charge at any point on the line. When you get into the lethal methods, um, this has been a very popular way to control um, predators for a very long time. However, there are some new predatory laws um, and trapping and, and things like that. You just have to have a little bit more understanding on what is allowed. Again, that's why I suggest maybe going and talking to your local conservation officer. In the past, poisoning has been used, but that method is almost universally banned today. We do not recommend poisoning at all. And um, make sure you stay up to date with some of those local laws. So in um, in instance of the black-headed vulture, we may have seen a little bit more of the information and the news about those. And recently, there has been a change in the law in Indiana where you are allowed up to, I believe, five um, lethal actions against uh, black-headed vultures before you have to secure a permit to be able to um, hit any anymore. Um, you may have to look at what your issues are with those domestic dogs. Um, that's kind of a controversial problem. So trapping um, or even shooting are really not a great idea um, with the domestic dogs and, and maybe not the right thing to do for keeping up uh, good relationships with your neighbors. Um, you, in most states, owners have the right to protect their livestock, and I know in Indiana that is also correct. Um, you may just be able, need to have to show a proof of animal harassment to your livestock. So, um, putting up game cameras um, or anything of that nature where you'll be able to collect picture evidence is best to do so, um, so that you've got some of that evidence if you need to go and have that discussion with a neighbor. Most of your predators are territorial and do not allow others of their same species to hunt in their area. Um, but there are, of course, ones that hunt in packs and they can become quite large. And then, of course, the territories can start to overlap. And that's where you see a lot of your issues. Um, so the predator populations um, have control. So there are some times of the year where there are some control uh, methods available where you can go and shoot hunt um, those sp specific things and then they do start to dissipate or reduce lives um, if there's a decrease in the prey species main source of food they may um, start to show an increase in intact on your livestock because they're hungry um, so looking and uh, maybe understanding what is your mice population, rabbit population, other types of varmints that you might see might also give you an indication of why you may have a predator um, attack increase or seeing or hearing more of those predators prowling around your small ruminant areas. There are several publications out there on different trapping and methods that you can consult. Let your extension educator know if you have some issues and that's an issue or a method that you would like to try. Um, but again, that's probably not a really great one to have depending on where you are and depending on the type of predator um, that you're looking to help deter or get rid of on your area. Um, and I know I went through those very quickly, but um, we've got a fairly large section next coming up. And Cora's going to talk a little bit more about um, the option of livestock guardian animals. Um, so that's our third choice that we're talking about today. Right. Okay. So as Miranda said, my name is Cora and I've been raising sheep for eons, it feels like. So um Pretty much you name it, it's happened to us. And so we've done a lot of what Miranda's doing, kind of learning by trial. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story about why we got into guardian animals. Um, we had a neighbor, just like Miranda was talking about, with um, dogs that got off of their property and would just come over to our sheep uh, pens and run our sheep all over the place. And they were St. Bernard's huge massive saint bernards and they were very friendly to people they would come right up to us and we could pin them and we'd tell our neighbor these animals are harassing our 
our livestock and we never did get the video proof that uh, Miranda is talking about, but they did end up killing quite a few of our sheep one day. And uh, so then we were able to sort that out with our neighbor, but we did not want to go through that again. Uh, so we decided to look into livestock guardian animals and we ended up going with a dog and we'll get to dogs down the road, but I want to start with, um, can you click Miranda? There's some words on here. All right. Yeah. So livestock guardian animals are not a new thing. We've been using livestock guardian animals to keep our livestock safe for years and thousands and thousands of years. So um, first thing we've been using back in the day has been dogs. So if you'll click again, um, dogs have been used to protect sheep and goats um, since basically they've been domesticated. Dogs have been used for a variety of purposes. Um, and one of those has been keeping our animals safe. Can click through. Uh, why do you want a livestock guardian animal? Well, just like Miranda was saying, you know, you can only go so far improving your facilities and um, improving your your lethal control. You're not always there with the animals. Sometimes the animals, the fence might fail and the animals might get out. And what a livestock guardian animal can do is it can always be with the animals. It's always there. It's always going wherever they're going. And so it's they're actively protecting them at every moment. So that's why um, livestock guardian animals have been so popular. Um, next slide. Go ahead and click. There's four bullet points. All right, so um, we have some USDA research that says that there's 280,000 reported sheep and goat deaths in 2004. So that's some older data, but that only probably goes up, you know. And so um, you can prevent predators with your fencing. You can pen your livestock at night, just like Miranda was saying, and you can keep livestock guardian animals. So it protects you from wild coyotes, urban dogs. Um, there's even, just like Miranda was saying, I've heard of mountain lions, bobcats. Um, there was even a, a bear wandering through southern Indiana at one point in time. So you never know what's going to be around and, and livestock guardian animals can kind of help you out with that. So go to the next slide, please. Today we're going to talk about three specific species, donkeys, llamas, and guardian dogs. Um, there are some people that use other animals, like Miranda was saying, if you have cattle on your farm as well, cattle are bigger and they tend to present a little bit more of a challenge. And so um, some of those predators may not think of your smaller animals as worth it if the animals are in or near the cattle. And, and so those animals, maybe even horses, could also provide some deterrent although those animals may not necessarily go after the uh, predator like you would want them to. So today we're going to talk about these kind of animals that are really going to stay with your livestock, they're going to protect them, and they're going to go after the predators. Next slide, please. So you can see in this picture, um, a, doggy, a donkey can do the trick. So um, that donkey has a coyote in its mouth. Next slide. Um, you're going to need a donkey that's big enough. A miniature donkey just isn't large or strong enough to repel predators effectively. Um, you can get a um, kind of a medium sized, no, you don't have to get the giant jacks, but you can get a, a regular sized donkey. Um, you want a sturdy one, somebody that's healthy, uh, and you don't want an intact male. An intact male is going to potentially hurt your your small ruminants, your sheep or your goats. Um, but a Jenny or a gelding should be a better option. Uh, you can adopt these from equine rescue organizations. Some of them will even let you borrow it for a little bit and see if it's going to work out before you actually um, purchase or adopt the animal. So these range in price um, depending on where you're getting it from 100 to 800 dollars probably there are ones that are more than that. Um, Next slide. 
Um, they're born with a hatred for any wolf-like animal. So I don't know if anybody's ever had a donkey, um, but you don't want to let your dog run around outside there with the donkey around because it's going to stomp on it. It's going to bite it. Um, they don't really need specialized training, um, but we will talk a little bit about what some disadvantages are here in a little bit. They do have really good hearing and eyesight. Just them being taller than the sheep, can, sheep or goats can also really help. They have a better view of the world so they can see further than the other animals can. They do live a long time, so that's a really great benefit. Um, if you've got a good one, then you're gonna have a good one for 25, 30 years, which is great. Um, and they can eat a lot of the same feed that your that your small ruminants can, um, unless it's like, like this says, unless it's laced with ruminzin, so that's a, a beef cattle additive. So um, that's gonna be a concern if you have a donkey in with your cattle. Um, which you certainly could use a, a donkey as a guard animal in with your cattle to protect your baby calves. Um, that's something that we used to do back when I was a kid as well. So next slide, please. So here's some disadvantages. You do need to have a, a gelding or a jenny because those jacks are gonna be aggressive not only towards your animals, but towards even humans. Um, they could potentially kill the lambs or the kids. Um, and they they might even get a little randy with your uh, larger small ruminants as well. So you don't want them to hurt or damage your your investment. So. You also need to have one, so one donkey. If you have more than one donkey, they might hang out together and not spend time with your flock or your herd of, of your sheep or your goats. So an individual solitary animal is gonna spend more time hanging out with your sheep or your goats. Um, unlike the dogs that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, donkeys haven't been bred for generations to look after livestock. So some it's not like one specific breed of donkey is a good selection that they've been bred to protect animals. It's more of kind of an innate hatred for the wolf type animals and some animals just don't have that. So it's important that you find one that's specifically interested in guarding your animals and not interested in just hanging out in the corner of the lot and not doing anything. Um, so it can be much more difficult to find a good guard donkey than it is to find a good guard dog. Um, but if you have someone who's already used an animal as a guard animal and they know that they're reliable, um, somebody who has started trying to breed for those animals, those are the kind of people that you want to look for to purchase your animal from them or do a trial period, um, especially where you keep the animal in with some some of your larger sheep or goats um, that don't have kids or lambs that could be damaged by them um, and, and see if that's gonna work out for you. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about llamas. You can go on to the next slide. So llamas can work as a single or in pairs. Um, they still do have a little bit of that uh, thing we were discussing with the, with the donkeys where if there's two or even more of them, the llamas are gonna stick with the llamas and not stick with your sheep and goats. Um, so just that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you want a, a human friendly male or female, um, probably still want a gelding. Uh, the intact males can still be aggressive towards you and towards your, your small ruminants as well. Uh, you can, just like the, the donkeys, you can rescue a donkey, you can adopt a donkey, or you can, adopt a llama as well. Just make sure that you can take it back if it's not gonna work out. Um, and then you could purchase them for 200 to $750, depending on uh, where you're getting that from. Um, again, if you decide to have two, try and make sure they're the same sex, unless you're really interested in breeding llamas, in which case you're really probably not gonna be using those animals as um, guardian animals. If the llamas, that's in with the sheep or the goats can see llamas somewhere else, they're gonna be interested trying to spend time looking at or, or hanging out with those animals if it's across the fence, and they may not spend time with the, the sheep and the goats and keeping them safe. Next slide, please. So llamas, just like donkeys, they naturally dislike any dog, wolf, coyote type of animal. Um, they're gonna call an alarm that usually gets your sheep or your goats to gather to them. Uh, 
and they do have similar feed needs to ruminants. You don't have to worry about the rumensin problem that the donkeys have. Um, and, and they live a, a decently long time, 15 years. Um, so that you could have one for a while. Next slide, please. Um, again, we need to have a pair of the same sex. They're good against your less aggressive predators. So something like a fox or a single dog or a single coyote, something like that. They're better against that than a large pack. They can easily get overwhelmed by that or a large aggressive animal. Um, they're a lot more aloof, so that's why it comes in handy to have one that's a little more human friendly so that you can catch them, work with them. They will need continued care. Um, you may have to do some parasite control and treatment because they can get the same parasites that your small ruminants can. Um, they also don't do well in hot, muggy climates, so that shearing them once a year to prevent heat exhaustion comes in really importantly there. Uh, I also want to mention real quickly, when we're talking about llamas as guard animals, we're talking about llamas. We're not talking about alpacas. So alpacas are a much smaller animal, and they're not going to be able to have really the size advantage over um, a predator that a llama is. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So now we get into the dogs. So next slide. Dogs have been used for millennia. They've been used forever. Um, we we have domesticated dogs, and part of them that reason is to keep our farming interests safe. So we've been doing that forever. Um, Thirty-three percent of American sheep and goat producers report at least using one breed of livestock guardian dog. So it's pretty popular. Um, they can the the breeds that you want to use. They're going to be the large, intelligent really kind of strong-willed, headstrong kind of dogs. Um, and at night, you know it's working when they're barking. So that they do a lot of barking. And it uh, might keep you up at night if your barn's really close to the, or your animals are really close to your house. So that's something to think about. Next slide, please. I think it's a great idea to visit other owners and see what works well for them with their dog uh, before you buy one, because uh, you're gonna probably spend a decent chunk of change on buying a good dog. Because um, these dogs, as we said, have been bred for millennia to do this purpose. So you want to choose one that's a working dog, not one of the ones that's it's a show animal, um, but you want to pay a good amount on for it because it's an investment. It's something that you, it's kind of one of those you get what you pay for kind of situations. If you don't spend a lot of money, then you're probably not getting a good deal. And um, so that's something to think about and definitely talk to other people who own dogs and use them for livestock guardianship uh, before you step into this because you don't want to go about it the wrong way. Next, please. So you can have either purebred or crossbred dogs. Um, just make sure if it is if it is a crossbred dog that it's crossbred between two livestock guardian breeds because um, if it's only half Great Pyrenees and it's half Australian Shepherd, you're gonna have a mess. So um, make sure that you have a dog that's really bred for this purpose. Um, you can get concurrent dogs because a dog's lifetime is not going to be the same as that of a donkey's. You are going to potentially want to start a new generation before your old generation has finished working. Um, they can help each other. It does take some finessing to introduce one of those older dogs to a new dog, but um, usually you can work it out. Um, and you can keep them in the same pen with your your livestock. You could keep them in the same pen as your even your poultry, your sheep, your goats. Um, just just keep them in the same pen. Just like Miranda was talking about, all of those different ways to keep predators out. You're also using those good fences to keep your dogs in. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. So you can see in this picture that they're using some uh, pipes around the dog's neck to make sure the dog can't go through a fence. Um, so 
disadvantages of owning a livestock guardian dog, they can be potentially aggressive. Now, usually that's just if you start with an older dog or you don't um, acclimate the dog well to yourself if they're being aggressive to humans. Um, and if they're being aggressive to their animals, then it can be a problem um, depending on their age. So I've found from experience that when you get a puppy and you want to start bonding your dog to the animals at a very young age, it's really not only bonding it to the animals, but bonding it to your location. So you want to get your puppy and you want to have it comfortable in the barns and the barn lots and the pastures that you want it to live in forever um, from a very small age. So um, I found that they they start playing around and they can play inappropriately with lambs and they can hurt and harm your lambs or your or your kids. So it is important if you have a puppy to keep them perhaps only with the larger adult animals and less so with the um, lambs and the kids and those that are giving birth um, because it can be kind of sad. Um, we have actually still have a few sheep uh, on our farm from when one of our dogs was a puppy and he would chew on their ears. And so their ears are all kind of like wrinkled because they were damaged and they were okay, but um, that can happen. So um, this third bullet point, I wanna say depends on the animal because uh, if you minimize your human interaction too much, then your dog won't come up to you. You can't lead it on the leash and it's not something you can take to the veterinarian. And it's really just not a good resource for you if you can't handle your animal. Now, you don't want your animal coming inside your house because then it's not spending time with the sheep where, or the goats where it needs to be, right? So you want to minimize its spending time away from its herd. But when it's out where it's supposed to be, it's A-OK -okay to give it pets and cuddles because I have a dog with a head this big who will just come running up to me and want his ears scratched. And that's A-OK -okay if he's out there where he's supposed to be. But if he's away from where he's supposed to be and I'm trying to get him back where he goes, then I'm not giving him any attention until he's back where he belongs. So that's part of the training of our dog to keep him in his, in his pen. Uh, it can take up to two years before they want to guard. I think that also depends on the animal. I think that the animals may start spending doing loops around the pasture and kind of seeing where they're at even before they're two years old. Um, and then they can roam. So that does have to do with whether they're neutered or not and um, whether they're kind of finding enough stimulation at home. So they might start go, going to look for some trouble if they don't find enough interest at home. So they can be aggressive towards other dogs and so that includes your household pets. So if you have household dogs, don't take them out to the barn anymore. Once you have a livestock guardian animal, your household dog does not go out to the barn. You don't wanna get that livestock guardian dog used to any other dogs, even if it's a dog that always lives at your farm. Um, uh, you can play with a puppy, but again, out in their turf, where they're at, not making them a house dog, don't bring them inside. Um, so they can want to play and that can cause them to damage your lambs again. So if you give them good things to play with, regular dog toys are fine. Um, just try and make sure that they're spending their time where they need to be. If your dog just isn't working out, try to rehome them, but you may need to recognize that it's a, it's not going to work out as a livestock guardian animal. And you might need to give it a home and a place where it's not gonna be around a lot of livestock. Next slide, please. Can I just add, Cora, yeah. while you're here, yeah. when you're looking at guardian dogs too, um, I would highly suggest to find an adult to start with and not a puppy if you aren't um, well-versed in how to take care of them or how to train them. I purchased a 18 month old dog so literally still a puppy and we struggled a little bit um, and I would have done better if I'd bought something over two years old to start with um, and get my feelings before I start got another dog to be that next round up right 
I, I think that can be a good option. I think in some cases, depending on the animal, uh, they may already be bonded to a different location and a different animal set. And so they may spend more time trying to roam and get away. And so if you do get it, start with an adult dog, take your introductions really slow. They may not be familiar with your animals. If you're yep. buying a dog for the first time, your sheep or your goats aren't gonna be comfortable with a dog either. So you have to train your sheep and your goats on how to interact with the dog as yep. well. Um, because there can be a lot of clashes and if you just have a little puppy and your sheep are trying to protect their their animal or their young, then they may knock that puppy end over appetite and that, that puppy may not have any interest in seeing those sheep ever again. Yep. So taking those introductions really slowly is really helpful for both sides of the, the situation. Both sides of it, yep. 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 All right. So here we've got some of the breeds of livestock guardian dogs, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail. I think there's another list of them too. Yeah. Uh, so then we're going to go into each one of these a little bit more specifically, but I want to say that um, herding dogs are not livestock guardian dogs. So there are dogs out there that we raise, like Border Collies, Australian Shepherds, that that people who have small ruminants, they raise those animals for a specific purpose. And you do take them out to the barn. They're still working dogs, but they're not guardian animals. So they're not intended to spend full time out with your, your sheep or your goats. Um, and they shouldn't be crossed in with your livestock guardian dog. Part of the purpose of a herding dog is to move the sheep to keep them going someplace or for some purpose. Um, and you want your, your livestock guardian dog to just spend time with the sheep, to not antagonize them, to not take them places. You want your guardian dog to just stay and be with them and make them feel comfortable. Because when a guardian dog starts barking, you want your sheep to all run towards the dog. You don't want them to run away because they think that the the dog is trying to herd them someplace you want all the animals to run towards the dog and so um they will start naturally doing that um but only if you have a guardian dog and you're not also trying to use the animal to herd them okay next slide please so we're going to go through these pretty quickly um and then i'll give you my experiences with the ones that i do have experiences with um, and then we'll make sure these slide sets get sent out to you so that you have access to these as well. So an Akbash um, is a little bit smaller size of dog, less than 100 pounds. They're also from Turkey. Some of these other ones you'll hear are like that as well. They're white. Um, they can suffer from, I want you to notice they can suffer from his hip dysplasia. Um, that's going to be a common theme. Uh, lifespan 10 to 12 years. They have uh, shorter hair, so they can uh, be slender with the, these shorter hair, um, and that's different from some of these other dogs. So next slide, please. So the Anatolian, also from Turkey. Um, these guys are more muscular. They're more imposing. Uh, I was talking about the dog that's, that's head is bigger than my body is wide. He's an Anatolian. Um, they're truly devoted to their herd. Um, they can withstand hot weather. Uh, they also have hip dysplasia problems. Uh, these guys are heavy. They're very big dogs. And um, the reasoning behind why we ended up with an Anatolian is because of that hot weather thing. Our, we got tired of having to take our guardian dogs to the groomer or spending time brushing and shearing them. Um, so an Anatolian is really good because we don't have to do any of that with him. Next slide. The Briard, these guys are from France. Um, they're alert and powerful dogs. They do have that really long coat. It's a double coat. So um, these are the kind that you don't really shear them. You do need to either take them to a groomer or, or know how to deal with a double coat before you um, purchase a dog like this. Uh, they also have that uh, hip dysplasia issue. Next. Great Pyrenees. If you've heard of livestock guardian dogs, you've probably heard of Great Pyrenees because these are the ones that you're going to see pretty much most commonly uh, in the United States. They are originated in those mount the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain and France. 
they really like wide open spaces. So if you've got a lot of animals in like a forested area, these maybe aren't going to work out for you. Um, they are pretty friendly. Uh, I know a lot of people own them as pets even. Um, they're not easily uh, commanded. Uh, they have a little bit of that headstrong will that we were talking about makes a good guard dog though. Um, they do have these thick coats and so you do need to care for their coats and make sure they're cool and comfortable during the hot and humid part of the summer, especially here in Indiana. They have that hip dysplasia problem. Uh, these guys, I think a little bit more tending to roam. They like to travel, they like to go. So if, you're, if you've got a really small place and you've only got a couple of acres, maybe Great Pyrenees are not a great option for you because they need a little bit of space to wander around. So um, our first dog was a, a half Great Pyrenees and he did a little bit of roaming, but he was, he was a great dog. Next slide, please. This is a Comandor. Uh, my first livestock guardian dog, he was half Great Pyrenees, but he was half Comandor, which we hadn't really heard of before. And then we, we got him. And so he did have a really unique coat because the Comandor do have that uh, cords that you, you kind of need to care for. Otherwise they just become dreadlocks or mats that can be dangerous and, and detrimental to the animal's health. So you have to care for those. Um, they do have a big, they're big body dogs. Uh, they have that hip dysplasia issue as well. That entropion that's there in the hip dysplasia line, it's actually like an eye, eyelid rolling inward that can be surgically corrected by the vet, no problem. Next, please. These are the Kuvash dogs, um, also originated in Hungary. Um, they're a one family dog, so they're going to protect their flock, any of your kids. They're going to protect you devotedly. Um, they can also have hip dysplasia. Next. Marama. These are Italian dogs. They're kind of a smaller dog, less than 100 pounds. Loyal, a little bit more aloof, but they also look a lot like a Great Pyrenees. Um, hip dysplasia. Last one that we're going to talk about today, the Sarplanac. Um, this is the Balkans is where this dog is from. They started as a shepherding dog, but they have breeding, bred adjustments into it. Um, they're a smaller dog, but they're alert, vigilant, loyal. These ones don't block, bark a whole lot. So if you are concerned about barking, maybe this is what you're looking for. Um, they also are subject to hip dysplasia. So I want to just talk real quick before we get into the next slides. The fact that all of these dogs are subject to hip dysplasia shouldn't scare you away a whole lot. That's kind of just a, a an issue that's often seen with big dogs. And you want a big dog to be out there with your sheep and your goats to spend time with them. Um, it needs to be intimidating to your predators. So your bigger dogs are going to have slightly shorter lifespans than your house dogs. And they're going to have different um, kind of joint and mobility issues as they get older. So maybe when your dog's five to seven years old, you should start thinking about getting your next generation started because those dogs only live maybe 11 years. So you want to kind of think about that um, as you're going down the road for your dog selection. Next slide. These next slides are kind of just comparison slides. So they're going to compare all of those breeds that we talked about. This is a weight comparison one. Next slide. Um, this one is about effectiveness. So this is just a survey. The sample size you can see is in that first column there. So you can see how many people owned those dogs and completed the survey. Um, and then you can see the percentage of those people that thought that their dog was very effective, somewhat effective or ineffective. Um, so percentage wise looks like a hybrid or an Anatolian are getting the highest marks for very effective, but um, aggressive to predators, Akbash and Kuvash are the ones that are 100% pred predator aggressive, but those are all really high numbers there. Um, to other dogs, you, you've got some that are in the 60s, but still pretty high levels there. So um, really that's just a all of these dogs are great for what they're trying to do. Next slide, please. 
Um, this first column or first grouping here is problems. So I don't really know what that means, but um, whether people thought they had problems with the dogs, um, whether they're minor or versus major. Um, and then staying with the sheep, you can see that down there, the Great Pyrenees actually has a little bit lower on the mostly than some of the other breeds do, but there's some in the 30s on mostly staying with the sheep. Dog injured sheep, dog bit people. So those are options, those are things that can happen. Um, certainly, if you've got an animal that's got some level of aggression, even if it's supposed to be directed at predators, it could certainly be directed um, at your sheep. Or if you have other livestock like cattle or horses or something like that, it could antagonize those animals. I know our newer dog has kind of bothered our horses a little bit. It shouldn't be in the pen with the horses, but it'll get in there with them and chase them around. And it's not ideal. Um, our previous guardian dog bit somebody because we were actually selling this gentleman a sheep and we didn't keep the dog locked up very well and he was loading the sheep into his trailer and the dog bit him because he was stealing a sheep so i mean you can't fault the dog for that that's really our fault for not having him locked up good enough but um so yeah we had a dog that bit a person uh next slide this one is where you can see kind of recommendations on which ones would be good for poultry you can see they're all good for sheep and gold so if you have some poultry around as well then um your Briard, Great Pyrenees, Comandor, and Maremma are ones that might be good to also protect your poultry because that's something to consider is that if you allow birds out and about, then you might lose some of those. Just like they're small and easy to play with, just like lambs and kids, especially if your dog is a younger dog, you might have some losses as far as poultry. On the other hand, if your dog is interested in getting rid of birds, you might not have as much potential problem with maybe hawks or vultures like Miranda was talking about. So there are some overhead birds that can cause problems. Um, so if you have a dog that if you have problems with birds, you might want to get one of those animals that is more interested in herding birds. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to wrap up by saying that um, a livestock guardian animal is a great investment. I think it's really good to do that, but you also have to consider the fencing aspect. You have to consider the lethal control. You have to come at it from several directions. It's a, it's a concerted approach to predator control. Your dogs are gonna work better where they can depend on their nose. So dogs, if you have a forested area, a dog is gonna work better than donkeys or llamas. Those are great and open areas where they, they're taller than the, the sheep and the goats. So they can see further and they can detect movement a long ways away. You may never see your guarding animal attack a predator. You may not find dead predators in your pasture. You're gonna need to measure your success based on reduction in loss. So that's where you're gonna measure your success. If you've never had any loss, and then you really don't have anything to measure towards, but then if you continue to not have any loss, then your dog or your animal is doing a great job. So um, does anybody want to share any experiences they have? Or Miranda, do you want to jump in and talk about your experiences a little bit? If you want to um, share in the chat yeah, box, sure. th then we can read those. If anybody wants to drop a, a, a few comments in the chat box while Miranda is sharing about her story. Sure. The uh, The reason I got um, into livestock guardian dogs for my sheep is I was actually doing a trial on one of our par public parks to um, eat down some invasive species. And so we put out six animals and in our temporary fence and made it hot and thought kind of things were going to be OK. But the very that very night, there were several walk lines where there was definitely some traffic of predators not sure what it was never saw it um so we uh, i purchased actually borrowed a dog from my friend to put in there and then ended up purchasing that dog because i was just absolutely thrilled by um watching his behavior and how he worked well yeah he was a young dog but he had always been working with a set of older dogs um his parents and so he he learned from day one 
how to manage and work with goats um, specifically as well as sheep. Um, and my first major you know, wow factor was the fact that he laid down, he's an Anatolian shepherd. And as soon as we put him in the pen, he laid down and I'm pretty sure he laid down for about three days until those animals all got used to him. Um, and I would watch him belly crawl to go over and get a drink and eat his food. And then he'd belly crawl back over and sit in a corner and just watch him. Um, and that to me was just absolutely amazing. Uh, and then the second really amazing thing I ever really saw with him is I had a uh, yearling you leave her baby in the barn and he went out and made, made her go back up the alley to get that baby. He cut her out of the group pushed her back up the alley to get that baby. And then as soon as they reunited, he just kind of dropped his head and walked right back out and laid down in the middle of the flock. So um, he kind of sold me on having a guardian dog there. We had some dog problems um, and I never lost any, but I had some fences torn up. So we did some fence repair, changed a few things on that, um, put some more hot wire in, and now we don't have any problems between him um and the hot wires the one thing i'll say is um he does roam he does patrol a lot and there are days that i don't actually ever get my hands on him or see him um, because i think he's out just making sure everything's good we've got the cows we've got the sheep it's like 300 acres total that um is on this farm so there are days i never even see him but my female is always with the herd Right, and I do want to share that I've I've also I've had a dog for a long time. Um, he was starting to get up there in age, and we have probably 20 -ish acres. It's not a lot of space, but um, we do have woven wire fencing, splitting that up, and we did have a coyote loss at some point um, while we had a dog. But that doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't doing his job because he was one dog. So, you know, if he was protecting the sheep that were in this other pasture over here, he wasn't also able to protect this other flock over here. So if you're going to have separate flocks that spend a lot of time on separate ends of your property, you might need more than one dog. And um, unlike the donkeys and the llamas, you can have multiple dogs, probably not a whole bunch of them, but multiple dogs will effectively protect your animals rather than hanging out by themselves. Um, just make sure you do want to see them moving around. You want to see them checking the perimeter um, because that's how they're able to spread their scent around and kind of just stop predator problems before they start to. Yep. Yep. Every time we move, those dogs make a perimeter check in the new field and then they go back and lay down. So, um, yeah, I, I constantly watch to see that they're doing their job. And my female is 10 months old um, and she just now is learning kind of what she's supposed to be doing. We had some issues with our lambing this fall, um, but Cora helped me out a little bit with that. And, and I think we we're good now. So um, yep. all a learning it, process. It, it certainly is. And, you know, the more you can learn about it from other people who have been through it is is the better so so we've had lamb losses to puppies as well so it's not it's not a new problem just something you have to consider before you're going to put in a dog with a with some lambs or some sheep that are having lambs yep. all right if you want to go there's two more slides but it's really just references and then a question slide so if anybody has any questions they want to pop those in the chat box but i think we're getting really close to the end today so if you have anything to say, don't don't hold your peace. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. You will receive an email shortly with a survey link. Please complete that survey for us if you can. It is a a voluntary survey, but anything you do with that helps us out. So have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you back in October for Meat Goat Genetics.